Thank you for your interest here at North Hills, where we are more than Sunday. If you have any questions or would like to know more about our ministries, you can always visit us online at north-hills.org. Now join us as Pastor James delivers his message. Well, there are some dates in your life that many times we put on the calendar. We think way ahead and we think, there's a date I need to... I need to be ready for and I need to plan out. And some of these dates are things that you are really looking forward to and others are things that you are really dreading. The things that you're really looking forward to when you're a youth school, summer vacation, looking forward to that? Yeah, looking forward to summer vacation. When you're a youth growing up, you look forward to your 16th birthday. Why? Because for whatever reason, we let 16-year-olds drive cars. As you get a little bit older, you start looking forward to graduation. You put that one on the calendar and you're really just excited to just be done with the easiest part of life. You get a little older, you start looking forward to your wedding day. Start looking forward to that day when you get to be married and and begin life together. Start looking forward to the birth of your children. Though if I were to ask Amanda, that may be one of those things she's looking past to it to being over, but, you know, for us guys, you know, our, we don't really do much there, so we're just looking forward to it. You get a little bit older, you begin maybe planning for and thinking about retirement. You start looking forward to that day. And then we think about things that we know are coming, but we dread, like daylight savings time. Daylight savings time is theft. You start dreading your kids starting summer vacation. You start dreading your kids being able to drive. You start dreading the day your kids grow up, graduate, move out, and start their own lives. You dread your little girl's wedding. Or your little boy's. You start planning for these things, and you you know they're coming. You know they're you you you're supportive. You know that these things are just a part of life, and they're the the stages of life. But in in one sense, we look forward to things, and from a different perspective, we also dread the same things. We're not going to get in the way of those things, but at the same time, we're not in any rush, right? We're not in any rush for them to get here. We want them to come in their own time, but not premature. At the right time, when the time is right. We know there are certain things that are coming. We haven't even begun to talk about those unexpected things that just kind of show up out of nowhere. The things that you're not planned for, the things that you're not, like you're dreading that the possibility that they might happen, but you know what, you can't plan for them. We haven't even talked about those kind of things. We're just talking about the things that we know are coming. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago on that first Christmas morning, it was all part of a plan, and there was already a date on the calendar, a date that began long before that, began even before the foundations of the world. There was a date on the calendar that Jesus and God marked in red. We know it is Good Friday. The date was that one day Jesus would, would, would grow up. He'd become a great teacher, but the date marked in red was the date of the crucifixion. This was the most important date in history. It wasn't an accident. It was planned from the very beginning, and it was there waiting Everything was drawing towards it. All of human history is drawn towards this one pivotal day in history, the cross. Pharaohs of Egypt ushered it along by protecting the Jewish people in Egypt and helping them to become a great nation and then sending them out, not willingly. The Greeks helped lay the cultural foundation for Jesus to be able to come into a a place with the same language, the same cultural norms. Later on, Rome would finance this day. All the while, God was working his will through history to ensure that it would all come about at the exact 
right time, in God's timing, just as it was planned. It was made of wood and it was shaped like a cross. And it was the most beautiful picture of God's love while also being the most brutal form of punishment you can possibly imagine. And the question then becomes, do you think that Jesus was looking forward to this day or dreading this day? Kind of hard to to imagine. But I think we're going to learn today that this was the day Jesus was looking forward to since the creation of the world. This day was to be his ultimate glory in God's plan. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter 17. John chapter 17 is this picture of Jesus' soul right before Good Friday. It's Thursday night. They are just finished the Passover meal. They are just finished in that upper room with the Lord's Supper, seated around the table. Judas has already walked out on them to betray Jesus. And, and here we find Jesus, as the night moves on, in the garden, praying. It's the longest of Jesus' prayers in the Bible, but it gives us a picture of what Jesus was experiencing in his hour of greatest need. It is a picture of Jesus' soul. And for the next three weeks, we're going to be taking this piece by piece, and we're going to look at the entire prayer. But today we just focus on verses 1 through 5. Next week, we'll look at a second part, and then the last week, we'll look at the final part. Second part, Jesus prays for his disciples to strengthen them in their time of great need. And the third part, he prays that their mission would be successful and even prays for all those who would believe through his disciples' testimony about who he was. But this first section, verses 1 through 5, Jesus prays for himself. Prays for what he's about to go through. But what I think is important for us to see is that he doesn't just pray for himself because he's selfish, but he prays that God would be glorified through what's about to happen. Let's read verses 1 through 5. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you've given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had before the world existed. Gospel of John throughout is this story that begins kind of at a regular pace, but then as you move throughout it, it gets quicker and quicker and quicker as the tension and the suspense leads us up to what it calls an impending hour, an hour that is coming. Four times in the beginning, Jesus says that my hour has not yet come. John tells us that Jesus' hour hasn't come, and one of the reasons why nobody's seizing him yet, even though he's saying things that anger people, his hour has not yet come. Five more times we're told the hour is coming. Now finally, in John chapter 17, we're told the hour has come. It is time. The time has come for Jesus to accomplish what he came to the earth to do. And that was to die on a cross. He came to this earth to fulfill that mission alone. What does Jesus do? Because now we're in this, he knows what's coming. He knows exactly what he's going to experience. He knows that the cross awaits him 
tomorrow. But in this night, in this hour of trials, in this hour of struggle, what does Jesus do? Well, he prays. He prays to the Father. He prays to the Father because that is what he always did. Now, we have to understand that, that Jesus' hour gives us a little bit of a, a, a foreshadow of, of our own lives. All of us have these hours in our lives that are coming. Maybe it's a struggle. Maybe it's something that we are going to have to respond to. We don't know how, but we know these things are coming. If Jesus experienced this, we can expect that we'll experience struggles as well. So what we want to talk about today, and, and this is our, our big idea, it's just a question. When your hour comes, how will you respond? Jesus responded by praying. But we also know that Jesus didn't just pray when his hour had come. No, this was something that he always did. Luke 5.16 says that regularly Jesus would find lonely places to pray. No matter his busy life, as he walked through, he healed people. Everybody was demanding his attention. Everybody was demanding his time, which he freely gave. He loved people. He had compassion for people. I love that picture when the the little children are coming to Jesus and his disciples are pushing them away. And he says, no, let the little children come. Even little children Jesus made time for. He always had time for them, but Jesus never, ever neglected his time in prayer with his Father. He loved that time. He loved the prayer time that he had with his Father. Even before his hour came, he prayed. So even before your hour comes, pray. Get in this habit. Pray just as Jesus prayed. We look at this, you know, if we look at John chapter 17, we see that Jesus did pray quite a bit. This is a, and I'm sure this isn't word for word, he prayed for hours that night. But I think this gives us a picture of his heart, a picture of that relationship. And the very first thing he prays for is himself. His hour is here. This is going to be a really, really long, tough 24 hours. By this time, tomorrow night, in Jesus' prayer, he knows that he's going to be in the tomb. This is going to be a long night, and he needs to pray. Jesus needs to, he needs to remind himself and God of some things. He needs to remember and stay focused on the purpose of, of what is happening. But all underneath all of this, Jesus is focused singularly on one thing, and that is the glory of his Father. Jesus is concerned that what he's about to go through, however horrendous, however like ugly, torturous it is, that this hour would bring glory to his Father. He knows that this has been his glory since before the foundation of the world. And he prays that God would glorify him just so he can glorify the Father. He's so looking forward to that glory. He wants to make sure that in in this time that relationship is not severed. He wants to make sure that that relationship that he has with the Father is not just something that when bad things happen that he feels disconnected from God, but he stays focused on that relationship because he knows that God will carry him through that. We know that God sustains Jesus through the crucifixion, that he helps him, he strengthens him. Sometimes people think that when Jesus was crucified that God severed that connection, but that's not true. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit were intimately involved in what happened on the cross. 
It's not to say that the Father and the Holy Spirit were crucified with Jesus, but to say that they weren't involved would not be to follow the text. He needs that relationship now more than ever. It will never be as tested as it is right now. Jesus prayed for that relationship. Jesus prayed. And I, and I wonder, for us, when we come to these hours, these tough times in our lives, when we struggle with what's going on in our lives, when we struggle with what's going on in lives of loved ones, when we struggle with our jobs, when we struggle with all of these things, what is our response? How do we respond to those hours? I think many of us, there's another hour that comes in our lives. I think that everyone, at some point in their life, they come to an hour of decision on whether or not they're going to trust in the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross or whether or not they're going to reject it. Sometimes it is overt in your face rejection. Other times it is just passive, just ignoring it. But we come to that hour, and how will we, rea how will we react when we come face to face with what Jesus did for us on the cross, the invitation to put our faith and trust in Christ. How will we respond to that hour? Because that's the most important hour of our lives. But then once we have chosen to put our faith in Christ, that's not to say things are going to be easy now. Oh, I, 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 I have salvation. Uh, I put my faith in Jesus. I prayed a prayer. Now life is going to be perfect. No, it's not. There's hours of struggle and tribulation that are still coming. Do you pray even before those hours come? Jesus went on. Because as his hour came, he had to remind himself, and he reminds the Father... It's okay, God knows what he's going to say before he says it. God knows what we're going to say before we say it. But it's okay to remind ourselves and to remind God of some truths about life. Jesus reminded God and himself who he is. So for us, when your hour comes, remember who you are. Jesus had a special relationship to the Father. He had a special relationship in that, you know, Jesus was God's son. We talk about believers being sons and daughters of God. We get that by adoption. We are adopted into the family of God because of what Jesus did on the cross. But for Jesus, he was God's son. He had that special relationship. And in times of struggle, in that moment, he might have been tempted to forget as if he could who he is. He could get distracted from his identity by focusing on his pain. He could get distracted from what he is supposed to be doing. But Jesus never once doubted who he is. He always knew he was loved by the Father. And I'm sure that when Jesus came as a baby, there was some, I don't know, did the relationship I'm not saying it changed, but there was something new about it. Jesus was here in the flesh. It would be easy in these times of crisis to forget who he was. And I think in this moment he needed to remind himself. He needed to remind himself of the glory that he had before creation with the Father. He needed to remind himself that his glory was the Father's glory, and vice versa, that the Father's glory was his glory. He needed to remind himself that God had given him all authority. He had to remind himself that the Father is the only true God, and that Jesus Christ is his Son, and by definition is also God, I know that sounds a little, you know, that, that whole Trinity thing, we don't quite totally understand it, but it's there. 
He'd remind himself of this. And we think if Jesus reminded himself who he is, if Jesus reminded the Father who he is, how much more should we remind ourselves daily who we who are in Christ are? Remind ourselves of what Jesus did on the cross to purchase us for the Father. That because of what Jesus did on the cross, that we are adopted sons and daughters. This is why in Jesus' prayer that he taught his disciples, he told them, call him your father because he is your father. We need to remember that. We need to remind ourselves daily that because it is easy for us to find our identity in our crisis instead of our identity in Christ. to find our identity in our pain rather than in our redemption. It's easy to forget that our identity is rooted in our relationship with the Father, just as Jesus' identity was rooted in his relationship with the Father. That is who we are. Now, Jesus was sinless, you say. Jesus was perfect, He had no stumbling blocks to that relationship. Me, I have my sin. And every time I try to pray, I just feel guilty for what it is that I've done. And I feel like that distracts me from that relationship. I'm afraid to go to the Father because I need to fix myself first. You're finding your identity in the wrong thing. You're finding your identity in your sin rather than in your salvation. Our identity is that we are sons and daughters of God. But it's easy to forget that. Particularly when those, those hours come of struggle and, and trial because we wonder, if God loved me, why is this hour coming? If, if, if I'm struggling right now and if God loves me, why is this hour here? I, I thought he would save me from that. God didn't save Jesus from that hour. In fact, it was all part of the plan. Just because your hour comes does not mean that you cease to have your identity in God. The other thing that Jesus did was he stayed focused. And when your hour comes, stay focused. It would be easy for Jesus to to think about a whole bunch of other things at this time. He could think about, woe is me, why God, why is this happening? He could think about all the things he still had to do. For every person that Jesus healed, every person he gave sight to, every child he blessed, think of all the people that he didn't heal. Think of all the people that he didn't give their sight back. Think of all the children that didn't get blessed, at least in his earthly ministry. Jesus was a great teacher, but he could have been a great political leader. He could have overthrown Rome, set up his entire like, kingdom right there and ruled perfectly, but the people that he ruled would still have a problem with their sin. In Jesus' hour of need, he stayed focused. He stayed focused on what he came here to do. And he tells us there were three things that the Father gave him to do. Give eternal life to those who the Father has given to him. He defines eternal life as knowing the one true God and Christ whom he sent. Second thing was to glorify the Father. And then the third was to accomplish all the work that he was here to do. And now the hour has come. The work is done. Everything Jesus came to earth to do in this hour, and we're including the cross in this hour, 
He's speaking preemptively of the work of the cross and of the resurrection. The work is done. He tells his disciples, time is coming and I'm going to return to the Father. Why? Because the work that he came here to do is done. I think this is where many of us struggle. In our walk with Christ, with our relationship with God and his church, we just want to know, what am I supposed to do? Anybody think about that? You go through life and you, you accept Christ and then all of a sudden you get really excited and now it's like, okay, what, what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do with this life that has been redeemed by the blood of Jesus? Am I supposed to just go to church? Am I supposed to read my Bible every single day? Am I supposed to find lonely places to pray like Jesus did? Am I supposed to volunteer with Upward? Yes. What am I supposed to do with the life that I've been given? And I think this is where we struggle. Because all of us want to stay focused, but we don't know what to focus on. What did Jesus focus on in the time of his greatest need? He focused on the Father. And from the Father, he found his purpose. His purpose was to bring glory to the Father. And through the, the way that he would bring glory to the Father was the cross. To give eternal life to people. You see, we actually play a part in that. And we'll see that in week three of this sermon. Just to give you a little spoiler alert. Jesus prays for those whom would believe on account of the disciples' testimony. We're included in that. So therefore, Jesus is praying for us and those who will believe through our testimony. That's our purpose. To tell people. And here we have Jesus, the night before he was crucified, focused. Focused on his father and the work his father gave him to do. And this is where two and three kind of intertwine. You know, the one before this, we talked about how who you are, your identity. When your hour comes, remember who you are. But we know that our identity is often intertwined with our purpose. We want something to do. We want people to be. And do you struggle more with your identity or more with your purpose? Because I think if we really think about it, those two, if we struggle with one, we're probably struggling with the other. But Jesus never doubted who he was, and we shouldn't either. No matter what we do, no matter what we've done, we shouldn't struggle with our identity in Christ. And because of our identity in Christ, it should give us a renewed sense of purpose in telling the world about him. And then the fourth thing, when your hour comes, trust that your father has a plan. Jesus trusted that his father had a plan. In verse 5, it says, And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory I had with you before the world existed. This was always the plan. The, always the plan that Jesus would be glorified. And we know that Jesus' glorification was the cross. As through that experience, he was able to give eternal life to all who would believe in him. That's basic Christianity, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him would have eternal life. And here we have eternal life defined. He would give, the plan was always the restored relationship between God and his people, the father and his children. Now, many times I, I hear people talk about God is in control. You know, when something bad happens and, you know, you have that well-meaning friend that come over, you know, you, you've just lost everything, and they're like, God's in control. While there's, a, where there's truth that I don't really like that, because guess what? 
when firefighters get a fire under control, it's still burning to the ground. God has a plan. God has a plan for everything that we experience, that we go through. Jesus trusted that the biggest, most painful experience that he would ever have on earth, God had a plan for it. And actually, not only did God have a plan for the crucifixion, it was a part of the plan. It was the plan. And he just trusted in it. God had a plan for Jesus' suffering just like God has a plan for your suffering. Paul tells us that he does not consider the suffering of this world to even compare to the glory that is to be revealed to us. Everything we experience, all the struggles, are momentary in light of eternity. Everything that we experience, those hours that come or are coming or have come, are meaningful in that they draw us closer to the Father. Jesus' hour came, and it drew him closer to the Father. When your hour comes, how do you respond? When that struggle comes, does it draw you close to the Father, or does it pull you away? What if the next time when you face that hour, rather than your response being, why God, it was, Okay, God, what is the plan for this? You realize that it doesn't matter if you lose your job or your loved one. It doesn't matter if you get cancer or get rejected. All of the trials and tribulations of our life are incredibly meaningful to bring glory to God in our response to them. Because the world is watching how followers of Jesus respond to the struggles of this world. How will we respond? Do we believe that God's plan is bringing about an eternal weight of glory? That God's glory can also be our glory. Do you trust God in the good and the bad? Do you trust God for better or for worse, in sickness and in health. Sorry, I got weddings on, on the brain. But that's the truth, right? The same things that we talk to newlyweds about. Hey, life as a married couple is not going to be easy. But you work through it. You struggle through it together. The same is true of our relationship with God. Being a follower of Jesus is not going to be easy, but you know what? It's meaningful. I'm always amazed that in, in, in Greek, and the word for faith can also be translated trust. To have faith in God is to trust him. So what? Okay, so what all of this, you know, we're, we looked at what Jesus prayed for. What does this have to do with us? Well, there's an obvious truth here. Jesus was never in denial about what was coming. Jesus never was angry about what was coming. He didn't bargain his way out of it. There isn't even passive acceptance of it. Jesus was not an unreluctant Savior. He was willing to go to the cross for you and for me. He was active in this. Nobody made him do anything he didn't want to do. He was looking forward to this. This was his glory, to bring many sons and daughters to a renewed relationship with God. It was an incredible act of love.
The obvious application, obviously, is that if Jesus Christ being perfect with a perfect relationship with the Father thought it important to stay connected to his Father in regular prayer, how much more should we? How much more should we go to the Father in prayer regularly, not just when our hours of struggle come, but even when things are good? Praise him in the good times, Praise him in the mediocre. Praise him in the bad. But I think something else we need to consider is that if Jesus had a perfect relationship with the Father, yet still experienced the cross, God will not always spare us from our hours of struggle in our lives either. But I have to be honest. Growing up in the church, as a young child, I, I feel like I was taught something, and I don't think anybody directly taught this to me, but it just kind of overflowed out of a lot of the teaching, and it was this. If you are a good boy, and you don't do too much bad, God will always bless you. So what happens when a young boy grows up believing that if he's good enough if he goes to church enough, if he prays enough, if he reads his Bible enough, and then life begins to go a direction that he didn't intend. He begins to struggle with things. Tragedy happens in his life. How does he respond to that when the teaching has always been that if I'm good enough, if I do everything right, God will bless me? Well, I'll tell you what happens. When life starts falling apart, I assume that God is angry or upset with me, that I'm not good enough. And I know I'm not alone in my generation in, in, in believing this because I've seen it far too often in my own friends. We all grew up in church together and most of them are off doing their own thing because they got through life and they realized that what they learned didn't match up with their lives. And I see us do one of two things. One, we assume that we're not good enough, that God is upset with us. We double down on all of that, trying to make sure that we do everything a little bit better. We're going to pray harder. We're going to read our Bible more. We're going to go to church not just once a week, but three times a week. We're going to go to churches that reinforce that we're not good enough and that, no, why not, that God is upset with us. And if we would only work harder, that God would bless us. I've seen people do this where they'll, they go through life, they did everything, and, 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 and they feel that God has not lived up to this imaginary bargain that they made with him early on in life. I've done all this for God. Where's my job? Where is my house and two cars living in the burbs? One thing that I'm seeing more and more with our younger generation is where is my spouse that I've been waiting for? God, I have followed you my whole life and you can't even give me a wife or a husband? You would think that that would be a silly thing to walk away from the church from, but I've seen it. In VBS and things like that, we learn verses like Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We learn Jeremiah 29.11, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. It's strange that we never memorize John 16.33, which actually is the verse right before this starts. I've said these things to you that in me you may have peace. Why? In this world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Right there before Jesus prays, John tells us a promise. Things are going to be rough, but guess what? Jesus is with you. And this is the struggles that we have, because I think many of us have built up in our mind, we want the things that God has to offer. We want the car, we want the job, we want the wife, the husband, the 
the two kids, the dog. We want all of the good things that God has to offer, but what we don't want is God himself. And what Jesus says in John 17 is, we get not a reward, but a relationship. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the one true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That is what we get. And the question I think each of us has to ask is, is that enough? If we never get the house, if we never get the car, if we never get the wife, if we never get the dog, the, the cat, if we never get the peaceful life, is that enough to just have God? For 11 men, we can throw Paul and some of the others in there, They were killed for what they believed. Yet, God was always enough. God was enough for them. So I'll finish up with this, and I just want you to listen. I, I need to say this to you, and I need to say this to me. I need to say this to our young people and our older people. God is not angry with you. God's not angry with you for not praying this morning. God is not angry with you for being late this morning. God is not angry with you for that sin that you committed 10 years ago. Jesus' death on the cross was not about a reward, not about blessing you and making your life perfect, but Jesus' death on the cross was about restoring you to relationship with God. That is the message of the gospel. That's why Paul says in Romans 18, that's why he says that the present suffering of this world is pales in comparison to the glory of eternity when we spend eternity with God, worshiping him. And if you want the things of God without God, that sounds pretty boring to you. But if you want God, then that is the sweetest thing that you can possibly think of, eternity worshiping God. I'm gonna end with this reflection as Josh comes up to play, is there an hour coming, or maybe it's already here, for which you need to pray, remember who you are, focus on what you're supposed to do, and trust that God has a plan? Let's reflect on that for a few minutes, and then we'll come up and close the service.